Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who are used to this show, you're used to seeing you get here. I can assure you that there has not been a coup d'etat. I'm here because of a raison d'etat. Well, Transparency International created the Integrity Award 13 years ago in order to recognize the courage, the determ determination of the many individuals and organizations confronting corruption. Often they do so at great personal risk. Since then, the awards have honored activists, journalists, civil servants, and many others from around the world. So it is a great pleasure to stand here before you to introduce the winners of this year's award and share with you their amazing stories, their courage, their conviction, and their integrity. Our most, we must adorn our examples to us all. Tonight, you will hear from two remarkable individuals who bravely push the boundaries to speak out against the abuse of power by elites in their countries. You will hear their battles. You will hear how they stood firm. You will hear how strength is inspiring others to continue the fight against impunity and injustice. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points how the strong man stumbles or where a deed could be better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marked by sweat and blood, who strives violently, who errs, who comes short and short, again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. So the credit actually lies with the man who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least, fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. That sounds very intellectual. It's not for me. It's from Roosevelt in his speech to the Sorbonne in April 1910. He spoke about the man in the arena. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight it's my pleasure to give you our men in the arena. Luo Changping and Raphael are here today for us to celebrate them and for us to celebrate our movement. Luo Changping is an investigative journalist who works diligently to expose corruption in his society, China. He has suffered reprisals for doing so, having been dismissed from his job at the newspaper in 2006 for his hard-hitting commentary. Several years ago, Luo, which time I say Luo, I think he's Kenyan, but he's not Kenyan, he's Chinese. <laughs> so, several years ago, Luo began an investigation into the murky financial dealings of a top official in the Chinese government. Late last year, when the magazine that Luo works for was reluctant to name the official in question in print, he took the courageous step of publishing the officer's, the official's name and details of the case on his personal blog. This was the catalyst for an official government investigation, which led to the dismissal of the official, Mr. Liu Tianan, from the party, where, were it not for the in integrity of the award winner's action, his conduct would have remained unchallenged. Rafael Marquez de Moraes is the authoritative voice on corruption in Angola. For many years, he has been a vocal critic of the government, daring to speak truth to power, despite the risks that this endangers. In fact, Rafael is all too aware of the dangers having been arrested and imprisoned in 1999. Well, if you haven't been to jail yet, I don't know what you're doing in TI anyway, so. After writing an article that denounced the Angolan president and the government for promoting corruption, threats continue to this day. The mistreatment did not silence him, far from it. Rafael has written in extensively on corruption related uh, to trade in blood diamonds, and he has documented alleged human rights abuses by the Angolan army. Last year, 
His reporting on senior government officials' hidden stakes in private oil companies led to a U.S. investigation of potential Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violations by a U.S. oil company. These two brave men, our men in the arena, have used their words to, to great effect in the battle against corruption. There are many of us who can raise our voices knowing that our lives are not in danger. But in many parts of the world, as you know, opposition to entrenched elites and corrupt power networks can be dangerous. We see this in dictatorships, where freedom of expression is harshly suppressed. We see it in countries where civil society is not even this is not given the space it needs to operate. We see it when those who dare to speak out are harassed and threatened. This is why we have to work together as a global movement to protect our members and ensure intimidation does not silence us. This is why we must speak out loudly with one voice against illegal arrest, strong arm tactics, and trumped up charges. In Rafael Marquez and Luo Changping, we see men who sacrifice their safety for our cause. And we are proud to honor them tonight. We all have much to contribute to the fight for a fairer future. Let their examples inspire us to work tireless, tirelessly to rid the world of corruption and protect those who have the courage to confront it, no matter what. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It is my singular, it is my singular pleasure to ask the boss of the whole process, Welly, or Welia. The last part of his name is Muna. I don't know why, but anyway, <laughs> to join me on stage and tell us about the process and carry on with the proceedings, Welly. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Integrity Awards Committee, I'm delighted to inform you that we have received 40 nominations throughout the world from 38 countries of outstanding individuals and organizations. The committee deliberated it for many months, as you know, we have done due diligence. We have also gone into the background checking and all what is required to pick up the winners out of outstanding entries. And finally, it came down to eight really outstanding individuals at the short listing stage, which posed a huge challenge to us, the committee members. And finally, we have selected two of them whom we are going to present to you today. It's my pleasure to stand before you in this evening to introduce our first Integrity Awards winner of 2013. In late 2012, the Chinese investigative journalist Luo Qingping did something incredibly brave. In three hard-hitting posts in his personal microblog, he exposed a high-ranking Chinese official for corruption. Luo had been investigating the official for several years, checking and checking again his evidence to establish corruption and corrupt involvement. Chai Ching, the magazine that Luo worked then, Low work then had already published the allegations, but without naming. They chose not to reveal the name of the official in question. But Luo went one small but a huge significant, uh, significant step further. He published the name of the official, the official being Liu Tiannan. And he alleged that the official and his family had been getting rich on illegal loans from Chinese banks, violating all possible schemes. First, 
there was silence as expected from the authorities. But then four months later, an official investigation commenced. In a rare victory for public efforts to expose corruption in China, Liu was expelled from the Communist Party and banned from office. The official was debarred from exercising his official functions. This is the only one part of Lua's story. A well-respected journalist, he has reported extensively on corruption and the abuse of power in China for more than a decade. He has suffered harassment, he has lost a job, he has received death threats and threats of all forms that you can imagine. Yet he, his success is proof that new technology has a vital role to play in China's struggle against corruption. We hope that the many courageous journalists in China who work to expose, expose graft will be given the space that they need to do this. We believe that Luo will inspire many others across the world to take stand against corruption. Luo did not have to take risk exposing Liu Tianman, but he chose to do so. This took courage, this took tenancy, this took integrity. It is my honor as chairperson of the Transparency International's Integrity Awards Committee to now present to you him with our Integrity Awards this evening. And, and before that, before that critical moment, we'll have a short film, I think, a yes. two-minute film of okay. this extraordinary gentleman. Thank you. Chu 我最开始的想法就还是想成为一个作家中国的纳税人根本不知道自己纳的税去了哪个地方透明度这个事情对中国我相信是一个非常重要的一个事情Give a hand, gentlemen, to Luo, my brother from another mother. Thank you. 
is translated here. Yes. Mr. Jingping will speak no, few months. The translation is yeah. in the headphone. Sorry. Yeah. Please okay. Okay. ask him to talk.谢谢尊敬的赖伯洛主席尊敬的阿克列副主席女士们先生们大家晚上好在我生活的城市北京大家现在最关心的问题是关于空气质量因为雾霾粉尘太严重这里产生了一种新的病症叫北京咳它跟长城烤鸭一样写入了这个北京的旅行手册但在北京在中国比这个大气雾霾更严重的是政治雾霾甚至可以说这个大气雾霾的产生跟这个政治雾霾的存在是
，也逮不住体大的老虎。互联网成了另外一张明霸的天网，可以结合不同地方、不同时间的个体进行分工协作，一个自由的思想市场由此形成，就是史无前例的信息反垄断。今天的中国，腐败几乎是一种生活方式，它如癌细胞蔓延到社会的各个角落，形成了全民腐败的共在结构。在过去二十多年里，在过去二十年里，透明国际组织做了持续而卓越的贡献，通过青年指数和行贿指数，测绘了全球的政治盲物。中国因此多了一面镜子，一个参照系。我昨天刚参观了，呃，这座城市的一个地标建筑——国会大厦。一个古老的建筑上面通过加加盖了一个玻璃的穹顶，然后使得阳光能够直接照射到议会大厅。我想做的也是一个非常重要的一件事。就是要更多的阳光能够引入到中国的政治，而且我们对中国的未来寄予了很高的很多的期望，比如呼吁推行官员的财产公示制度。这个世界上通用的阳光法案，正是扫除政治雾霾的最好工具之一。今天也是中国的记者节。我想，每一个职业记者和每一个公民记者都应该庆祝自己的节日。但是，我的不想同行因为正常的报道，因为揭露腐败官员的劣迹，受到骚扰、被免职、被逮捕、被判刑。呃，现在时候应该是北京的呃凌晨。我在参加这个会议之前。稍微留意了一下，在中国的这个呃社交媒体上的信息，记者行业普遍的一片悲观的情绪。但是我获奖的信息被很多的同行视为就是给他们一个非常大的一个积极的信号。我在这里其实也向我的同行表示致敬，因为我有好几个朋友现在在监狱里头。同时，也呼吁媒体和记者应该得到更多的尊重和保护，让他们在反腐中发挥更大的作用。在中国，要驱除政治阴霾，推进腐败防治工作，不可能只靠政府，也需要公民社会和私营领域的共同努力。其中，媒体是不可或缺的基本因要素。是建立阳光政府和特门政治的重要前提。最后，非常感谢透明国际对我的肯定，给我更大的勇气。祝你们生日快乐，谢谢。Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, if 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 you are a Chinese bureaucrat, beware. Luo is off the leash. I will now call upon our Paulo Batala, board member of the Transparency International, uh, Portugal. To come and present us, Rafael, my brother from another mother, Rafael. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to say a few words about Rafael Marques de Moraes. Um, when we at TI Portugal uh, discussed who to nominate to the Integrity Award, there was really only one name on the table. It had to be Rafael, we said. Um, Rafael Marx is an Angolan citizen in the fullest sense of the term. A, a journalist, a blogger, and a human rights campaigner, he has been for years a tireless worker for integrity in one of the most corrupt countries in the world. 
Angola currently ranks 157th in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. A small cadre of government officials, political and military leaders have been enriching themselves and their families with the country's plentiful reserves of oil and diamonds, while the Angolan people remain mired in poverty and subjected to authoritarianism and abuse. In this hostile environment, under persistent threat of persecution, assault and arrest, Rafael Marx has maintained a steadfast approach to researching the mechanisms of corruption in his country and exposing the shameful complicity of many governments, including, I am sad to say, my own, towards an Angolan elite that has profited and continues to profit while turning their backs on their people. Rafael's work is all the more impressive for his ability against all odds to thoroughly research the issues, bring the truth to light, and challenge the Angolan justice system to act on the information he collects. But upon meeting him personally, what strikes you most about Rafael is not just his persistency or his commitment to the cause of integrity in the face of huge obstacles. What captures you most is his sense of humor, the, the easiness and the generosity with which he takes on such perilous and difficult work, often putting himself in harm's way. No matter how high the stakes or how serious the dangers, he is never spiteful, he is never petty, never propelled by hatred, bitterness, or resentment. Sometimes the very worst situations bring out the very best in people. Rafael's answer to continued, often violent harassment, to corruption, to poverty and despair, is the sheer joy with which he continues every single day to stand up to those in power and demand accountability. In that, he is the embodiment of the fundamental dignity of the Angolan people and stands among us today as a beacon of hope for change. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased, proud, privileged to present to you Rafael Marques de Moraes. I didn't choose to be different. My mother always taught me values about honesty, integrity. Um, quite often I would go home and say, well, other children have this or have that. And my mother would say, well, I can steal for you. But then they will say, your mother is a thief. Would you like that? And I would say no. And I would never ask her again for anything. That's what formed uh, me as an individual and made me um, strengthen my resolve to do the right things. Now, the war has been over for 11 years. Nothing is being done to fight corruption. It has just increased. Uh, we have a political system that strives on corruption, survives on corruption, and that's why we need uh, tackle corruption very seriously if Angolans are to have uh, a chance of a better life. I keep fighting because I believe in a better country, in a better people, and I believe in being part of a society that stands by its moral values, by principles that go beyond what are the forces of destruction. Corruption is a force that can destroy a society. We need to show that we have the ability to fight for what is right. And many have laid their lives for it. And my fight is much easier. It's one just to pass the word on to the next generation. Listen and learn, Raphael. Distinguished uh, Lord Changping, my fellow co-winner, distinguished members of TI, 
I'll start with a story about my suit. A fellow Portuguese journalist told me once that uh, I went for an interview and looked very unkempt. And he said, well, mind if I give you something? I said, no. And he said, well, I have a nice suit for you because you have to show those corrupt officials that you can look very nice without being corrupt. <laughs> and then I said, how many suits do you have? <laughs> So ever since when I go to an event like this, I bring one of his suits. And I also took some 20 ties from his wardrobe. <laughs> and then I've been looking good ever since. <laughs> uh, last July, I was summoned by the Angolan Attorney General on 11 criminal complaints brought against me by seven generals. After I exposed their links to systemic human rights abuses, and corruption involving their enterprises in the private security and diamond sectors. While I was under investigation, a group of youngsters gathered in the square in front of the National Directorate for Investigations and Penal Action to express their solidarity and to encourage me. Among them, there was a 17-year-old fellow by the name of Manuel Nito Alves. It was the first time I met him though previously I had admired his courage as an anti-regime protester. I joked with him by calling him a troublemaker and reproached him for exposing himself unnecessarily. Uh, he has been experiencing political prosecution, brief arrests, and beatings since the age of 15. For his views and streetwise initiatives for freedom of expression, Against authoritarian rule and corruption, he has been a target of the state security apparatus. Today, I'm here to proudly receive this award in the name of Manuel Nito Alves, to whom I dedicate this honor. He has been in jail for the past two months, charged with outrage against the president. Angolan legislation that came into force in 2010 established such outrage as a crime against state security. Nito Alves is suspected of attempting to print 20 t-shirts, not more, with a slogan calling President Jose Eduardo Santos a disgusting dictator. A minor is being treated as a terrorist because of 20 t-shirts. Last month, Angolans faced three landmark events that encapsulated the state of governance in the country and which proved that President Duchantus is indeed a corrupt dictator. First, in his State of the Nation address, President Duchantus spoke in favor of the primitive accumulation of capital in Angola and in Africa in general, to ward off any criticisms of corruption and justified the wealth of his family and his cronies. Secondly, for the first time in the country's history, the government submitted the state's general account, the budget for 2011, to parliament for approval. Uh, this procedure was showcased as another step towards transparency and good governance. However, the president as head of the government did not submit reports for more than 70% of the expenditures of the 2011 state budget. Nevertheless, as the third interconnected event, the Constitutional Court ruled as unconstitutional the Parliament's oversight of the government, except for passing laws and the state budgets. According to this ruling, the Constitution and I quote, does not grant the National Assembly the power to raise questions and inquire into the acts of government, nor does it have the right uh, attributions to call upon the ministers, ask them questions, or hold hearings. Because Angola, in Angola, the ministers of state, ministers, and provincial governors discharge their duties as defined by the head of the executive who is the president of the republic, I quote it. Does the constitutional court rule that to have the power to make demands upon members of the government would be the same as having the power to make demands upon the president of the republic 
who is the head of the executive, which is the Constitutional Court states constitutionally unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today because of my work in exposing corruption. I have always based my standards on the Angolan legis legislation that exists supposedly to ensure good governance and pro pro probity. The above mentioned events are not a surprise, but they are a pattern of institutionalized impunity. Elections held in 2012 and the judicial system have been used only to provide a veneer of legitimacy to a kleptocratic regime that sees no end in plundering its own country and has no regard for the future of its citizens. As hopeful as I am, I have engaged in raising public awareness on the existing uh, anti-corruption legislation. Endemic corruption has become the main institution in the country. It is now a badge of honor for the ruling elite and the pursuit for those aspiring for a better life or to a better life. Yet, I strongly believe that it is possible to change the public mindset and making corruption what it is, a crime under Angolan legislation that must be dealt with as such. This is why I have lodged a number of criminal complaints against senior government officials and generals whom I have exposed as using public office to advance their private interests for personal enrichment. Uh, these are deals worth several billions of dollars. In response, the Office of the Attorney General has shelved such complaints on the grounds that those public officials on duty have the right as any citizens to legally own private companies that engage in business with the state from oil, diamonds, to public contracts, as long as they do not manage directly their private uh, affairs. In a recent investigation I co-authored uh, for Forbes magazine, I disclosed evidence on how President Dushantos used his office to issue decrees that enabled his daughter, Isabel Dushantos, uh, to build a three billion business empire through illicit transfer of state assets, shares, and funds within, in less than 10 years. At the moment, I am investigating how a state-owned diamond company, Sodium, which holds the exclusive rights to market uh, the industrial production of Angolan diamonds, has a secret joint venture in Malta with the President Dushanto's uh, son-in-law. Uh, in 2012, this joint venture uh, called Victoria Holding Limited, uh, in which each party holds 50% of the shares, bought 72.5% of the shares of Swiss jewelry maker, De Grisogonio. But through the documents I have accessed, uh, Mr. Fawaz Gruozi, formerly the owner of De Grisogonio, received in exchange 20% of the shares in Vitoria Holding. In essence, once again, there is no record that the presidential family paid a cent to have such shares and be in control of half of the Angolan diamonds marketed through this secret company. Furthermore, because it is a secret, this company does not turn up in the national accounting system as an investment of the Angolan state. Through this deal, diamonds worth hundreds of millions of dollars may now be siphoned from the Angolan treasury on a regular basis through a venerable jewelry maker that caters for Hollywood uh, celebrities. Ladies and gentlemen, it is at this juncture that foreign investors, international companies, and governments eager to advance their business interests in my country or attract Angolan money have become the support mechanisms of corruption in Angola alongside repression. To succeed in Angola, foreign investors must associate themselves through joint ventures with the presidential family, relevant government officials and generals, or those nominated by the powers that be, uh, might be. 
Such joint, joint ventures, once involving the state, break the anti-corruption legislation, and they can only survive due to the impunity enjoyed by the regime. Western multinationals and governments, and China in particular, therefore find it in their interest to protect such nefarious alliances, in which the only losers are the Angolan people. Much of the Angolan state budget is being spent on repression of the people. But corruption is also undermining the very foundations of the regime. And I give an example for the 2013 budget that just, uh, and uh, fiscal year that just ended. President Tushantos had allocated $13.1 billion in defense and security appropriations. And this is the largest budget for a defense force in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in spite of all these resources to date, uh, the government is unable to provide basic food rations, uniforms, boots, and basic living conditions for the military, the police, and other agents of repression. This is because the generals and the president's cronies steal much of the money. And that is also a fault line for eventual uprising. And this is how Nito Alves' arrest represents far more than a single activist in jail. It is also an illustration of how the regime has lost its bearings and has become erratic in its actions. I'm happy to announce that Nito Alves uh, was released this afternoon after I had written my speech and the term of identity. and residents to wait for trial. And I sing, oh, happy day. I ask you to join me in demanding the unconditional release of Nitu Alves. I also call upon you to stand up with the Angolan people and be part of the solution and not of the problem. And I thank you wholeheartedly for having provided me with such an excellent opportunity to renew the cause of fighting against corruption in Angola. Thank you. Thank you.